good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, free webinar on NIBOSH IG2, Technical Review, How to Study and Prepare for the Exam. Uh, allow me first to introduce myself. Again, my name is May Thomas, and I am the Senior Marketing Specialist of DISS. Now, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Number one. To ensure that everyone participates actively and enjoys our webinar, we kindly ask that your microphone be muted to prevent background noises from interfering with our speaker's presentation. Number two, if I may ask everyone as well to double check that the name displayed on your screen matches the name that you use to register. Number three, if you have any questions or need any clarification through the presentation, write them down or post a message in our chat room and we'll respond during the allowed Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. Number four, if you have any technical problems or concerns, you can also send a message in the chat room. And finally, although it is optional to turn on your camera, we do encourage you to do so because we will be uploading pictures of this event on all of our social media platforms. Any questions so far? All clear? All right. Now, without further ado, allow me to welcome our webinar speaker for today, Mr. Azar Salim, who is our NIBOSH specialist and the unit manager of our e-learning department, as you may have all I know that you have already uh, get acquainted to Mr. Azar one way or the other. You've been one of his students before. So um, also just a quick introduction about our speaker. Okay, Mr. Azar is a NIBOSH approved instructor and examiner for the IDIP, IGC, IOG, and PSM. And he also works in an, an, as an ISO consultant, helping various organizations adopt ISO standards. He is also a coach, as you may have all known, a motivator who has, who has assist, assisted hundreds of aspirants in earning internationally recognized health and safety credentials and professional membership. So let's all extend a hearty welcome to Mr. Azar Salim. All right, thank you very much, Ms. May, for the kind introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. I hope you all are doing good and well today. I do understand today is Friday and some of you might have an off day today. But, you know, please understand uh, the time that we would be dedicating today, the two hours for this webinar, that would be really worthwhile uh, to have success in your IG2 risk assessment report. You know, yesterday the results were out for our, you know, March batch of IGC, and I was really happy that you know all of our students have cleared ig2 risk assessment report because you know they have followed the guideline they have understood the criteria that neighbors requires them to include in their report and that has resulted in their success in that regard right so same is thing that i would want for all of our students whether they are our students or whether they might be you know studying with some other institute but you know success is the short-term objective for every student and obviously learning is the long-term objective in that regard. So let me just share my screen and let us start our today's session. Uh, all right, that's good. So I have shared my screen. I hope everyone is able to view the presentation that is there, right? All right, that's good. So everyone, uh, the webinar that we will be discussing, I will be focusing on the common mistakes that students make while preparing the report. You know, some of the things that they might have misunderstood, some of the requirements they might not understand properly in that regard. Though in our session in the classes, we try our best to explain everything, but sometimes, you know, uh, every student have, you know, different working hours. They might have limited time to prepare the report. And sometimes they might not have a good time to review the report thoroughly before submission in that regard. So in today's session, you know, we will try to focus mostly on the requirements, what is required and what we should not be doing in our report in that uh, extent, right? Now, uh, I would like to have an open session with you, you know, anyone who might have any question uh, and that time you can please post it uh, on the Zoom chat or you can raise your hand to ask a question within the session as well. Uh, participation is encouraged. 
you know, we are trying our best to make sure that you succeed. So you have to help yourself as well by clearing your concept, by making sure you have good understanding of the things that we would be discussing today. Okay, so guys, let us begin uh, in today's session. We would be talking about a couple of things. The first one is that what is IG2 risk assessment all about? What are the requirements in it? What Nibosh expects from every student to be there, right? Many times, you know, students think that, you know, I have prepared a really good report, but still it has not been accepted by Nibosh in that regard. The main reason behind it is that there are some of the things that we might have overlooked in that regard. Normally, when students seek my advice on guidance, I would always guide them that I don't think so you have fulfilled this criteria or this requirement of Nibosh has not been fulfilled. Here, I would like to stop and I would like to write something on the screen. You guys familiar with IG1, right? For IG1, how many are the passing marks? 45 marks out of 100, right? That is the criteria. What about IG2? Where do I tell my students? The passing criteria is 100 out of 100. Now, anybody who would get 0 to 99 marks, what does that mean? He will get a refer. A refer means you have not succeeded in that regard. What does that mean? 100 out of 100. That means you need to fulfill all the criteria. You need to fulfill all the requirements that, that are ex, uh, expected to be fulfilled in the IG2 risk assessment report. Now, that is why it is important for us to understand the mistakes other students make so that we don't make the same mistake, right? We should be learning from their mistake. So in order to ensure our success, and the main part of our today's webinar will be focused on the four parts of the report. There are four parts in our IG2 report. Part one, about the company introduction, background, our risk assessment methodology. Part two is about the risk assessment itself. So we need to write 10 hazards that are there. I will share with you exact uh, you know, examples that have failed so that you understand how that should be written. Then I will help you understand how to write the correct hazards in that regard. And then we'll talk about part three, right? And part three is about selecting three action items from part two and using them in detail for evaluation of the risk. And then part four, which is fairly simple, that is administrative. Now guys, there is a very simple thing, but an important thing for everybody to understand. You know, Nibosh, they have cried criteria that shows a logical flow of information. For example, I have used the company name here in part one, right? We mentioned the company name here. Now, ideally, that should not need to be repeated, but what they have done, they have asked you to write the same name again here in part two, just to check your understanding that you are not involved in malpractice, you know this is your own report. You should not copy mistake from someone else. Another important thing, for example, scope of risk assessment. That is written in part one, but that is again repeated in part two. That is to check you logically, that have you prepared your report yourself, you know what you are writing in that regard. In a similar way, there will be, for example, an action item in part two. Right, you have written different action item in part two. Now you have to use the same action item from part two into part three. That means it has to be a logical flow of information. Uh, it should not be something that you introduce a new action item here, which is not mentioned in part two, right? So these are the common things you need to focus on, which is basically Nibos criteria in that regard. Now, another interesting thing, is we have a risk assessment date that we mentioned in part two. Now that date is linked with part four in that regard, right? So many times students just make this mistake that for example, here they have mentioned 1st of January, 2023, but when they go to part four, they mention some other date, maybe 1st February, 2023. Now that just one date, 
just one incorrect date will get your report rejected. That is why I say it's 100 out of 100 that you need to score. If you get 99 out of 100, that will not result in a success in that regard. And in today's session, I will try my best to explain all the requirements and criteria to you in that regard, right? So I'll skip uh, the introduction in that regard. So what is the objective? of this risk assessment report. You know, this risk assessment report is part of our IGC program, right? So we have element uh, five to 11, right? Against which there is no exam. Why we don't have exam? Because we have to prepare a risk assessment report, okay? Now we need to understand that you need to select a company for which you will be doing the risk assessment. Uh, ideally, you should have good understanding of the organization. If it is your own organization where you are working, that can be the best idea. It can be your previous employer as well. It can be a company where you have done internship or something, but you should have good understanding of the company. If you can get documents from the company, if you can visit the company, that will be really good in that regard. Now, the important thing is that from this risk assessment, you have to identify the hazards present in that organization, right? There are common hazards, which mean which are present in every organization. Like if I say fire, noise, uh, stress, COVID-19, maybe dust, maybe manual handling, use of computer like display screen equipment, all these hazards are present in every organization. It doesn't matter you are making a report on a hospital, engineering company, mechanical company, construction company, you are making one report on Hamad International Airport or any other company, it doesn't matter, right? So if you are selecting common hazards, then your report should be fine enough in that regard. Then you need to evaluate and prioritize the risk. You have identified 10 hazards. Out of these, you need to select three action items that will be really important and that is basically what you can say high hazard in that organization so that you can show your knowledge to control them right how we can define their control mayor and in defining the control mayor everybody should not forget the hierarchy of control so we need to show that we can eliminate the hazard we can substitute we can define engineering controls we can define admin controls. And lastly, we can refer to the PPs in that regard. Many students fail because they just focus on this thing. Admin control, like training, supervision, uh, making a risk assessment, having a safe system of work, all those things. They don't focus on this thing, eliminating substitution and engineering controls. Now, we need to understand as per hierarchy, this will make the environment safe. And this would make the person safe in that regard. So what should be our priority? Do you want to make one person safe or you want to make environment safe for everybody? So the priority is this one, environment. Now, when we are deciding the control measure, we have to show our knowledge and understanding for the hierarchy of control. So we'll focus how we can eliminate the hazard. If we can't eliminate, is there a method for substitution? What are the engineering controls that we would be applying? that can protect majority of the people in the company, not just one person. When you say, I'm going to give a safety helmet to someone, I'm going to give an earmuff to someone, that is about protecting one person, one individual. And that will also depend that whether he follows the personal protective equipment properly or not. If he doesn't follow, then the control is not effective in that regard, right? Then, uh, you know, prioritizing the risk, and planning the action, that is also part of the element, uh, you know, part three of the report. And lastly, review and follow up. Like when you're gonna review the report, we say, okay, we're gonna review the report after one year. Uh, there might be other circumstances like change of technology, law, other thing when you're gonna review the risk assessment. And lastly, the follow up. So how are you gonna follow up the action items in that regard? So these are some of the interesting things that we will be looking into. So I'm going to stop here and I'm going to be showing some examples to you that why small things happen that result into a failure of a student. Now, a very simple thing is normally I would always advise student to write proper designation into the report in that regard, right? 
Now, students sometimes overlook this thing. For example, the designation which I don't, uh, you know, allow students to write. What are the wrong designation they can write? They can write management. They can write simple a manager. Uh, maybe uh, HOD. They can write a department. Now, these are not correct designation, which will not be accepted. This is a report of one of our students. And I clearly guided him that you should not write management. You know, this part two was rejected because he mentioned management against each action item. That is a very simple and basic thing, right? You just have to mention the designation. What can be a designation? Like procurement officer, HR manager, safety manager, project manager, operation manager, scaffolding engineer, lifting supervisor. These are proper designation of a PZ. Now, this is just one reason that his part two was rejected. And part two is the main part in the report in that regard, right? This is one example. Then another example is consequences. So every hazard has some consequences. So for example, in this particular situation, he could not justify the reason for working at height. What were the consequences in that regard, right? So for example, when a person would fall from height, there will be fractures, broken skull, broken back, permanent disability, joint dislocation. And many times students don't understand, they simply write, let me just write here. They simply write use of ladder. Do you think this is a hazard? This is not a hazard. If you use a ladder, how harm will be caused to anyone? We can write, uh, use of unstable ladder, right? Or use of ladder on soft ground. That can be another reason. These are the reasons which will cause the harm, which will cause the hazard. And then we're going to mention the consequences. If you use the unstable ladder, the person will fall down. And what will be the result of that thing? There will be injuries. There will be, uh, you know, accident in that regard. So this is another example. Then not understanding the Nibosh hazard categories. So people don't understand it, right? So what can be the category? So for example, they have one of the students have mentioned incorrect names, right? So it is just incorrect hazard category name. So he mentioned COVID-19. What is the hazard category? It is basically hazardous substance biological, okay? Contagious disease. Contagious disease is a consequence. That is not a hazard. Drop objects. Drop object is not a hazard, right? What is the hazard name? Working at height. When you write working at height, person can fall down, material can fall down. Adverse weather conditions. What is the name of hazard? Health, welfare, and work environment, right? And then excess and egress. So that will be confined space, not excess and egress. So sometimes students don't use the standard names and they get their report rejected in that regard, right? Then another thing, you know, just like I told you how the harm will be caused, right? So for example, one person say that I, I think noise is a hazard. Yes, noise is a hazard, but how noise will cause the harm? For example, I can write here, use of power drill for longer period of time will result in ill health effects for employees. So we do understand, yes, noise is a hazard, but how noise will cause the harm? It's gonna cause the harm because you are using power drill. How much decibel power drill produces? 110 to 120 decibel. And when you are using it for longer period of time, like throughout the day, then it's going to cause you harm in that regard, right? If you simply mention use of power drill or noise is there, that will not specify what is the hazard that you are talking about, right? So these kind of things happen. And lastly, I will just show you one report, okay? Uh, okay, I think let me just share it later. First, uh, let me stop here.
to ask if anybody would have any question uh, they can drop it on the zoom chat if something is not clear or they have some query in their mind uh, please be an active participant and try to learn from whatever things i'm sharing in that regard guys another important concept is suitable and sufficient risk assessment it's a legal term that we have studied in our course under element 3.4 risk assessment so we say a suitable and sufficient risk assessment there are two things to be there that you have identified important hazards and you have determined their suitable control measures in that regard if you have done it you have fulfilled your legal duty that you have carried out a suitable and sufficient risk assessment okay now i'm going to ask you a question for example in your organization you are using for example chlorine gas right now the control measures you have written in your report against this is you say for example we have done training of the employees uh, we have done for example risk assessment and we have given for example masks to people now do you think these control measures are enough or these are not enough what do you think the hazard of chlorine gas is there yeah it's not enough because we can right. start from the top um, hierarchy of control starting from right. the elimin uh, elimination substitution and yep till we get to the ppe yeah right so thank you very much Kaaba, for your input and thank you for mahesh and uh, abdul rahman and hassan for it so we have understood that chlorine is a highly poisonous gas it can easily kill a person and the concentration can be very low 20 30 ppm or up to 100 ppm can kill a person that is how much highly poisonous there's uh, that category is there in that regard and then the control measures these are just administrative control measure administrative control training risk assessment these are administrative administrative control measure can protect one person not the environment so just like what gaba said we have to focus on engineering control substitution and elimination in that regard if you do that then the examiner will say that yes your risk assessment is suitable and sufficient otherwise they will say you don't have understanding of the hierarchy of control and now there is one question is the hazard categories are the topic heading physical and psychological uh no dear i will explain this later i will tell you when i will explain part two that these are the hazard categories which nibosh have uh, specified us so basically this is the table that we normally explain in the class and within the session that these are the standard hazard categories we can use right the only thing here which might be confusing to the student is hazardous substance chemical and biological other than that one you know everybody knows the physical psychological and you don't need to write it that this is a psychological hazard when you say mental ill health it means that you are talking about for the psychological hazard in that regard all right so coming back to the thing that i was explaining suitable and sufficient so i had one example uh, this one i guess this student had not fulfilled this uh, criteria in that regard right for example, most of the time, you know, student write trailing cables and uh, this is also confusing for the student. You know, there is one hazard that is slips and trips, right? So slip means there is contamination on the floor. Trip means there is unwanted object on a floor, like a cable or a box. Now, many times what student does, just like here, he have mentioned trailing cables right and i have mentioned its control measures but the name of the hazard i have used is slips and trip so for slips i have not shown any information what will happen this will not be accepted in that regard right so many times this also thing happened that the examiner say you have not fulfilled all the columns 
or you have not fulfilled the criteria that is expected. If I show you a sample, uh, let me just share with you a sample that I have recently checked from a student because you know, when the result will come, sometimes the student might not like it. Okay, that okay, how my report is rejected. And they don't follow the guidelines which are explained to them. So if you follow the guideline, we can confirm that yes, your report should be uh, accepted in that regard. There should not be any reason why it should. But you know, part by part, if you go through uh, this report, the gaps that I have highlighted in yellow, these are the gaps that exist. So here, you know, one of the things we need to follow is every table has a word count requirement. Like it is showing 150, which is the minimum and 200, which can be the maximum. But my advice to student is always to write 200 plus words here, not less than that one. Why? Because you have to show your understanding. You have to show knowledge of the company, knowledge of the hazard, knowledge of the control measure. So don't write less. If a student has just written 100 words, and there are still 100 words remaining, that will not be accepted, right? So this is for part one. When you go to this part, lot of comments, which are requirement student have not written, right? I will explain these in detail uh, in the next part. I'm just showing you the gaps that are there while the student might have a misconception that, okay, my report might be correct. Now here the student is talking about a chemical. Right. And he have just mentioned burns, splashes, and allergies. Right. So just three things mentioned. That is not sufficient. That is not complete consequences. With chemical, what can happen? We can inhale them. It can go to our mouth. It can splash into the eyes and it can come into contact with the skin. So at least four things are minimum as a minimum. Right, there will be more, uh, and then with the chemical, we know short term exposure, we know long term exposure, right? So, all these things we need to consider when we are writing a report in that regard. Uh, sorry, Abdurrahman, I don't uh, got your uh, question uh, about material. Material, you mean chemicals that you are referring to? We can write for the chemical. There should not be any challenge in that one. Like any chemical you can select for your organization. It can be cement, it can be uh, petrol, it can be paint, it can be thinner, any chemical you can write about. So again here, uh, you know, just like the problem I pointed out earlier, the student is saying working at height is a hazard, right? But he doesn't, into the excavation. He's saying falling from height into excavation. This is half of the information. Half of the information is why the person will fall down into excavation. Maybe there is a slippery ground. Maybe there is no barrier around the excavation. Maybe there is no warning sign. What is the reason? What will make the person fall down? That is not there. So if you don't explain how hazard will be caused, it will not be accepted. Then again, in this situation, no consequences. He just mentioned fatal injury, right? In my class, I clearly tell student injury is not acceptable because injury is a generic word. If I say uh, illness, illness is a generic word. It does not tell me what is the problem. So we can say the person will get asthma or the person will have a headache. The person will have nausea. The person will have this, this kind of thing. Then you are specific in that regard. If you say fatal injury, what is a fatal injury? So you can say broken back. You can say permanent disability. You can say joint dislocation. You can say person can have paralysis. Person can have this. Then it is specific thing that you are talking about, right? Otherwise, it's just, you know, generic thing that you are writing, which will not be acceptable. And many times, you know, student don't understand. You have used working at high tier. One hazard is utilized. You cannot repeat the same hazard again. Working at height, if you have written, that is it. You have to pick some other hazard. Otherwise, what will happen? You know, from working at height, we can write 10 situations. Person can fall from scaffolding. Person can fall from ladder. 
person can fall from you. No, you have to show variety of knowledge. You have to show different, different, different hazards in that regard, right? So it is important for us to understand all these considerations when we are making the report in that regard, okay? So guys, I'm gonna open a template, which is the Nibosh template in that regard. And now we're gonna talk about the specific requirements. So from this point onward to the completion of the webinar, we will try to understand the specific information which should go into our report as a minimum. Mistakes, I have already told you in the last 30 minutes that what are the problems that can make a student report fail in that regard. Now we're gonna to try to understand the requirements so that we can make it perfectly, right? So guys, there are four parts in the report. Part one is about the company introduction, okay? Now we need to understand examiner does not know the company, right? You are the one who is going to introduce the company to the examiner. What does that mean? The company uh, examiner have not gone to the company. So you should give information in such a way that the examiner can imagine the company. That, okay, yes, it's a construction company. They make buildings. They make roads. They do like they make bridges in that regard. They are using tower cranes. They are using bulldozer. They are using cement, gravel, concrete in that regard. They have 1,000 workers. They do this. They do. So you have to create a picture. That picture should be good enough for the examiner to understand and accept your report in that regard. Okay. So if I go for the specifics one by one. So name of the company. Okay. So whatever is the company name, please write here. Right. And then make a three digit abbreviation of the company. For example, I say it's Qatar Construction Company. So I can make an abbreviation QC, uh, C, QCC. That can be an abbreviation of that one. Right. If you cannot use the company name, like for example, you might have a restriction on that one. Uh, or your company might not allow you. You can make a made up name. You can say maybe XYZ construction company. You don't have to specify the actual name. Nobody will verify that that company is physically there or not. It's you telling the examiner, okay, this is like a company that is there. With the location, please understand this is just country name, right? What students are doing, they are saying Lucille, Doha, Qatar. <laughs> you know, they are trying to explain the address. Don't do that. Examiner does not. If you do not mention country, it is Qatar, Nigeria, India, Pakistan, UAE, China, uh, you know, Kenya, Ghana, any country, acceptable. But if you don't write the country name and mention city and address, not acceptable, right? And I'm going to show you one thing that, you know, the criteria I'm explaining to you, if you see the Nibosh feedback, just see here. So your each and every information, like name of the organization, it is met. Location, it is met. How many workers, it is met. That means each information has to be accepted. That is why I say if one information is, like for example, in site location, you mention Doha, you don't mention Qatar. Examiner will understand Qatar. Examiner will not understand what is Doha. He will not go in searching the cities in the world. He will understand the countries only, right? And if that is not met, what's gonna happen? You will get 99 marks and the report is rejected. These are the things students don't understand. And then they are annoyed when they get the result that I have done so much effort on that and why it is. There, the problem is that each and every criteria has to be met. And that is what I focus in my classes, in my session, in my webinar, to everyone that we need to pay attention to all these uh, details. Uh, Yasin, I, I will come to that. You know, I have given some example. When I will come to that, I will tell you that why that part is, each column part is uh, not met. Uh, we are on part one now, so we will step by step go to that part. So let's just focus on this one. So the third information, number of workers. 
So you just have to mention a number here. It can be 100, 120, 200, 500, 1000. Please do not confuse yourself and say, okay, I have to write, okay, 100 permanent employees, 50 temporary, 50. Just mention total number of people at the site. Don't confuse it that these are permanent, these are temporary, these are contractor, these are, don't, just simply write one number. So I'll just write one number. Maybe it's like 100. Maybe the company I'm talking about that is in Qatar. And maybe the name of the company is, let me just say it's Qatar Construction. Uh, let me just write examples so that you understand in a better way. Why I have created abbreviation? Because I will not use the full form of the company again and again. That will consume uh, you know, my word count. So I don't want it. I'll just use a simple word QCC later on in the report. Column row number four is description of the company. So you have to create a picture of the company. What does the company do, right? So what information I can write here? I can write here when company was formed. Like you can say it was formed in 1990 by one person or it's an international company, blah, blah. What are the products and services of the company? So guys, who's going to tell me what is the purpose of a construction company? What does they do? They provide services. Yes. Civil so workership. Civil yes, workshop. Civil work. Right. Bridge, highway, roads. Yeah, irrigation. they do construction. So uh, yes. we will say these are the products that may make, just like what you told, roads, bridges, things like that one. And what are the services that they do? They can design for you. They can do the designing work. Uh, they can do landscaping. They can do civil work, electrical work, mechanical work, all those things you can write in there, right? So this is how we say product and services of the company. For example, if I say someone is writing a report on a hotel, what are the services of hotel? So there will be check-in service. They will have room for the people. They might have a swimming pool for the guest. They might have a car parking area. They might have some a sauna. They might have a gym. They might have some other, like maybe a snooker room or some other area. They might have a bar in the hotel. So these are the services that they are providing to the guest. This is what you have to explain in there, right? Products and services. Then you can talk about the people in the company. What are the people? So you can say there is a general manager, uh, there is HR manager, there is operations manager. So in this way, you can try to make a picture of a company. This is the hierarchy. They have three general manager, they have three division, they have two department, they have 10 department. In this way, you can try to explain. Then the type of equipment they use, right? What will be the equipment a construction company will be using? They will be using cranes. They will be using trucks. They will be using uh, forklift trucks. They will be using excavators, right? This is the type. Then the most important thing, which most of students don't understand is you have to mention the shift timings and off days. Now, what is shift timing? You will not write that it is morning shift, evening shift, night. No, you have to mention the timing. For example, I say the shift start at 6 a.m. and it goes till 2 p.m. That is eight hours. And from 2 p.m. it goes to 10 p.m. That is evening shift. So you have to mention proper timing of the shift, not just morning, evening, night. Then off days. So every company has off day. You can mention, for example, Friday. Or you can mention as per shift schedule. You know, if people are working in different shift, uh, you know, they might have a different off day. It might not come on Friday, right? Then, for example, it's an optional information. Now, what I'm telling you is an optional information. Maybe there is some vulnerable group. You can say the organization might have an expectant mother. Maybe they have a disabled person, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What will be the advantage of this information? This shows your knowledge of the company. So you know, okay, they have got you know trainees, they have got 
you know, expectant mother, they have got, so this shows that you have done a detailed working on the company. So, you know, good information. I hope this thing is clear. Now that thing is a description of the area. Now there can be two choices here. You can say, I'm going to do the risk assessment for the whole organization, or you can say specific area, or you can say project. So for example, I'm taking an example of a construction company. So I can say we are doing risk assessment for Lucille Stadium. That is the project name for where, where I'm doing the risk assessment. Okay. Don't mention activities. Many times students say, okay, I'm going to do risk assessment for welding, for excavation. No. Mention that you are going to do the risk assessment for the whole company or for that particular area. You can say uh, maintenance workshop, electrical department, or office building. So specific area. My advice to you is write whole organization. That is much better. Don't confuse yourself. This should be included or this. Just write simply whole organization. That is it. Now, any other relevant information, this is additional information that you can write in there. For example, you can say uh, uh, person responsible for occupational health and safety in the company. Who is that person? Uh, they have edges uh, health and safety department and its resources how many people they have they have got for example iso 45000 or other certification in that regard so you can talk about the arrangements that they have okay right now guys please understand i would advise student to write this information at least 200 words 200 words so the rest of the information when added it will go up to 250 or 300 that is okay don't worry for the word count when you have written uh you know correct information detailed information then please don't worry about for the word count now this is the simple part you know this is your introduction of the company if you write all this information perfect that will be accepted right now the second part in this one is also understandable uh, you know it's a little bit tricky okay so they are saying how you carried out a risk assessment so person can say i went to the site i did the observation i studied their document i did this i did this i did that right but there has to be a sequence there has to be a logical approach and what is that logical approach i'm going to tell you right now so sources of information your interviews and how you identify these are the three guidelines Nibosh has given us okay now guys please understand i'm gonna make a picture here uh, for everyone to understand so the first thing is study of ilo codes for example c155 plus there can be other codes which you can say QCS, et cetera, et cetera. That is number one step in doing the risk assessment. Why we are saying it? We are saying it because we don't have the prior safety knowledge. We are doing IGC and we are learning from C-155. What is the responsibility of employer? What is the responsibility of employees, our workers? So we understand it from that one. Once we study, what do we do? we basically prepare a checklist and we follow HSC UK guidelines for risk assessment. Why we are saying checklist? You cannot go to the site and start checking verbally. I want to see this. I want to see this. You need a checklist that when you go to the site, what are the things that you will check? For example, for slips and trip, what you will check? for electrical safety, what you will check, for housekeeping, for fire safety. So there has to be a checklist that you use to check things. And secondly, what is this risk assessment guideline? This is the five-step methodology that you have studied under 3.4. Identify the hazard, identify who is harmed and how, uh, determine the control, evaluate the risk and determine the control measure, record it and review. The five-step methodology. You cannot say this is my methodology. 
because that is not acceptable. Only acceptable methodology is HSE UK guidelines for the risk assessment. That is what we have studied in our course. Now, guys, once you go, you can say, I then visited the site, right? I am telling you the perfect method that you can write is there. No other method will be perfect than this one. Now you go to the site, what you can do at the site? Number one, you can observe people doing work, right? You will go there and you will see uh, a welder is doing a welding, a person is working on a scaffolding, a person is operating a truck, a person is doing excavation, a person is using a power drill. So you observe people whether they are working safely or not, number one. Number two, what you will do, you can talk to the, or I should write, talk to safety people. Like there will be a safety manager or HSC person. You can talk to them to identify the hazard. Then guys, you can interview people. And when you will mention interview people, you will mention a proper designation. Like I will say, I interviewed a welder. I interviewed a driver, etc. Like that one. And another one we can do is we can study the company documents. Right? When you go to the site, you will see company document. And two documents are minimum to write. Risk assessment and incident log. These two documents are minimum you should write. Now, once you have done all these steps, what's going what's gonna to happen? This is you have identified the hazards at site from all these things. So you can say at site there is fire hazard, there is noise hazard, there is cement, etc., etc. Right? You just have to write the name. You don't have to, you know, give a very detail because the word count is 200. So we have to, you know, remain within that one. And the last step in that one is this one, which mostly students ignore control measures. How are we going to determine the control measures? So the last step is you can write that I refer to ILO codes. For example, for construction, what is the code? C167 right c120 for welfare work environment other thing c155 so you can say i refer to the ilo codes to determine the control measures what are needed for the company so you have to write all this information in a logical sequence if you can write it this is acceptable any additional information is also acceptable but this is the minimum thing you write Whatever I have told you, this fulfill requirement of sources of information, who you spoke to, how you identify the hazard, what they are doing, any additional control. All of this is captured in this one. Right? Everybody clear on that one? Any questions? All right. So I hope that is all good. Uh, what I'll do is I'll take a picture and I'll just paste it here so that in case, you know, somebody might want to refer it again, they can do that. I'll just, you know, paste it here for the understanding. And if you want, we can also share the file with the students in that regard. So if somebody wants to work on it, they can use the guidelines or understand the guidelines before writing. All right, so, so we are moving on to part two now. Part one is done. Part two is obviously an important one which we need to understand and follow. Now, guys, the thing that I told you, organization name, date of assessment and scope. Now, this is just their way of checking your understanding and whether you have done your work. Even I will identify very quickly that the report that student have shared with me, it is his or he have copy pasted from someone else. I can quickly identify. The basic thing is that he would update the name here, but he will forget to update the name in part two. That is very simple and logical. So what I'll do is copy the name, which I used in part one, and I will come here and I will paste it here. Qatar Construction Company. Date of the risk assessment. This is also important. Last year, two reports were rejected 
because students, I tell them that this date should be at least one month before your exam. It can be more as well, but minimum one month. What does that mean? For example, today is your exam, 19th of May. So what should be the date here? One month before 19th of April, 2023. Now, why one month? Because this whole process of risk assessment, this is not done in one day. It will take at least, you know, uh, one month of whole process that you uh, studied the standard, you, you know, made the checklist, you went to the side, you prepared the report, you reviewed the control. All these activities, it's going to take at least one month, logically, in that regard. So many students, if today is the exam and you mention this date, it's going to be rejected. That is why in the session, when, you know, when we start making the report, I asked the student to write the actual date when they started working on the report. So for example, today you started working on the report, simply write the date, 19th of May, and your exam will be on say 7th of June, or you have to submit it in July. So that is okay in that regard, right? Then the scope of the risk assessment from where it is coming, part one. So what I wrote in part one, this thing, whole organization or whatever I wrote here, copy it and paste it in part two. Don't try to write something different. Don't try to write something different. You know, many times, every time I get a report, you know, student is writing something else in part one and writing something else in part two in that regard. Okay. Let me just merge these rows. These should not be separate right because you know i created it but students don't follow it so let's leave it so guys the most important part is this one part two of your report and most of the reports that i have shown you were rejected from this part right so what we have here we have if you see the columns uh, these are the information that air hazard category and hazards who might be harmed what are you doing about it? Like existing control measures. Then we'll talking about what are the further control measures in that regard. And then uh, time scale within what? Like one week, two week, three week. And responsible person job title. This is what I showed you. Lot of people write department or they write something else because of which the report is rejected. Okay. So guys, in order to understand this, I'll go back to my presentation because first we need to understand the hazard categories, right? I have shared this thing within the class as well that, you know, when we say hazard categories, what are those hazard categories? Okay, let's pay attention to them. So guys, we have five hazard categories. You have to write 10 hazard, 10 hazard from five categories. What is that one? Physical, chemical, biological, psychological, and ergonomics. So we have to write 10 hazards. Now, if I categorize these, noise, vibration, and radiation, what is this one? This is basically physical hazard, right? Then mental ill health, violence, substance abuse. What is this one? Psychological hazard. What is this one? Element number six, this is all ergonomics. And then we have chemical and biological. And from eight till 11, that is all physical. So guys, what are the common hazards that are present in every company? And uh, whatever company you select, it does not matter that, you know, which hazard you have selected in that regard. So whether it's a hospital, school, airport, the hazard that I'm telling you will be present everywhere, irrespective of anything. So you will not have a challenge in selecting the hazard for your report. Guys, electricity is present everywhere, right? There isn't any company where we can say electricity is not present. Fire is present everywhere, right? Then health, welfare, and work environment. Why I'm saying this hot work environment in Qatar. Everybody is familiar with heat stress, heat stroke, heat exhaustion. That is your hazard number three. You can also choose slips and trips. That is very common hazard, right? You can, you need to pick one chemical and one biological. This is five. 
this is six. So I would recommend you using for the chemical use dust and for the biological simply use COVID-19. Everybody has good knowledge of COVID-19. It can happen in any company as simple as that one, right? Then uh, manual handling. Do you think manual handling is not in any company? Every company has some manual handling activities in that regard. Right. Then we can also write about stress, work related stress that can happen everywhere. Even I can say noise, it's a physical hazard. It can happen everywhere. Even maybe violence at work, you can use that one or working at height. So these are the common hazards that you can use in your report. You don't have to pick the complex one, which is going to make you. Uh, you know, not explain the hazard in a good way. Like if somebody wants to write about radiation, you might not be able to write properly for the radiation hazard because it's a technical hazard, confined space. I don't recommend students to write those things. Try to pick up a topic which you can write very easy. For example, another common hazard is movement of people and uh, vehicle in the workplace. Why? Because forklift truck are move that is there in every company. And they can collide with any person so that we can use in that regard. Yes, Richard, you are right. Every company has manual handling in that regard. So guys, normally what I do, uh, you remember what we would have done in the class. Those students who are you know, uh, studying with me, uh, they would have an idea that we prepared an Excel file and we try to understood that, okay, what are the different hazard. So we have physical hazard, chemical hazard, biological, ergonomics, and psychological. And we picked up that, okay, we're going to write one physical, one chemical, one biological, one ergonomic, one psychological. And the rest of five hazards, they can be from any category. Mostly you can choose physical or something. Like from ergonomics, we can also use display screen equipment, which is computer related hazard, right? So please understand this thing. This is linked with your column number one. Hazard, category, and hazard. Okay. Now we understood that hazard, I'm going to pick. These are the hazard categories. Okay. So for example, first one I have written it here is fire. Now fire is the hazard category I'm using. What will be the hazard? Hazard means how fire will happen. Okay how fire will happen in the company. So I can say welding of So I'm saying welding of metallic object near fuel storage will result in a fire. Now I have written one hazard. I can write 20 hazard here. But I don't recommend you to write 20. Just write one or two maximum. You should not mix 20 hazards in one row, right? Just focus on one point. We need to understand one that we will focus on one point. Why? Because for this one, we will write the control measures here. If you write five points here and hierarchy of control has five points. So how many points will be there? Five into five. 25 points and that will be difficult for you to write. So don't create a problem for yourself. Just mention one hazard, one situation where fire will happen and just focus on that one reason, how you can control it, right? Now guys, another second column, this is column number one, okay? Second column is who might be harmed. If fire happens, who will be harmed in the company? So fire is one hazard that will affect everybody. So when there is fire in the building, everybody will be affected. So what we can write, I can say all employees will be affected, uh, contractors, uh, visitors, maybe uh, if there are neighboring community. I'm just writing example. I'm not saying that in every situation this will happen. This is just a sample for you to understand, okay? On contrast to this thing, manual handling, many students will copy paste it. All employees, why? Manual handling is not done by everyone. So who is doing manual handling? So for, for example, I will say loaders. 
there will be for example helpers there will be technician these are those people that will be affected by manual handling don't copy paste you know whatever you wrote in hazard one in every hazard that will be biggest blunder you can make now the second part is who might be harmed and the second part is how how they will be harmed right so guys what is the consequences of fire if fire happens what will happen death. people can yeah there will be death there is burn yes there will be burns loss yes, of so property is, yes loss of properties so i will explain it in detail i will say fire in building will result in property and equipment damage so you have to write it properly don't just write property damage that is incomplete for example people coming in contact with fire will have burns and blisters right then i can say inhalation of poisonous smoke will result in death right i can say this will be challenging for people with asthma and lung problem those people who have breathing difficulty they can quickly die in fire right so guys this is how you have to explain consequence when i say that you have not explained it that means you have just mentioned burn and death that is not acceptable right so i'll go to the second hazard and i i'll try to uh, share what i'm saying so you say what are the consequences of manual handling so you just write it there that there will be for example muscle strain now this is not acceptable you have to write proper detail that employee who is lifting he will have muscle strain right so i can write it here uh, frequent sorry for the spelling frequent lifting of material will result in employee having uh, muscle strain right now the second bullet point i have written this one this is acceptable but if you just mention muscle strain that is not proper detail of that thing right so try to write consequences like this one in proper detail now guys column number 3 and 4 this is your hierarchy of control so you have to understand that these two columns they complete your hierarchy of control now how is that for example existing control i have written training i have written ppe i have written risk assessment now what is ad, uh, training admin control ppe risk assessment admin control so out of hierarchy what is left now so what is left is elimination substitution and engineering control so when examiner will see your report both of these columns should complete your hierarchy of control now if you write admin control here without the above ones if this is not written you just mention more admin control what will examiner say examiner will say it is not suitable and sufficient you have not mentioned enough control mayor or he will say you have not shown your understanding of the hazard okay now let me try to put another example for example the organization has already eliminated the hazard and then they have written admin controls and pp this is what they are already doing so what will be your recommendation what is left out of hierarchy substitution and engineering controls so you have to think about these while writing in additional control mayor right this is how you will make uh, this one and i'm going to tell you the exact method how you should write the statements right so for example you know what student do they say toolbox talk 
what do you understand <laughs> by this thing this is incomplete this is not telling me anything i will write a proper statement toolbox talk is being conducted daily with workers to help them understand hazards of fire and relevant control measures do you think above one is correct or below one is correct where i have explained the purpose the objective of that thing why that action item is being done so you have to show your knowledge you have to show understanding if you don't write properly understanding is not there right i can also say for example for fire what they have done is a uh, risk assessment for fire has been carried out now student will think this is incomplete uh, sorry complete i will say this is incomplete why this is incomplete i will say risk assessment for fire has been carried out to identify the potential fire sources and determine their appropriate control measures now this statement is complete this is how you will write the statement whether it is column number 3 whether it is column number 4 many times you know uh, if i'll just show you the i'll sorry i'll just show you the examples that you know uh, when we write the statement and we think that is incomplete okay so just see this example student have written two action item equipment cord should be replaced equipment cord insulation rubbed off due to uses so it should be replaced so do we see any difference in 2 and 3 they are the same thing right then electric fuse is of correct rating i don't understand if it is of correct rating what is the benefit what is the purpose of uh, you know thing just like cylinder is color coded i'm just giving an example right how it will stop fire what is the benefit what is the purpose empty cylinder mark what is the purpose three words empty cylinder mark what will examiner understand from this thing right and then the student will say i don't understand why my report is rejected why because you are not understanding nibosh requirement you know nibosh will not understand your company or something you will have to follow their guidelines right so we have to be open and we have to learn these things you know if you want a success in the first attempt so just like you know again this is uh, you know try to see this uh, thing you know when you are not focused in writing dust mask is provided but it is not mandatory right now this is number 1 now what is number 3 dust mask mandatory board displayed right <laughs> which statement is correct above one is correct or below one is correct right this happens when you don't review your work you have written in hurry uh, there was pressure that you have to complete the report deadline is there but you have to review it you know dis gave you at least 3 to 4 days after ig1 exam that is the purpose of those days that after ig1 exam you should relax and review your report again to identify these kind of mistakes and try to see that okay how you can improve it and many times you know there are some illogical thing like again here if you see dust mask mandatory sign board to be displayed so the student is confused about the control he does not have clarity what he want to write about so at one place he is saying it is not mandatory second place he is saying i will install the board and again he is saying that that should be done what already it is done what, what you want extra from that thing right so this just one mistake will get your report rejected because you are not following their guideline you are not understanding hierarchy you are not checking your control measures are good enough or not right so guys coming back to the topic i was talking about fire now i will give you certain tips uh, which you know student should follow and i am saying should follow because that will make their life easier otherwise you know last time i have seen lot of student uh, get their report rejected even this sample this was rejected and i tell you this was not my student uh, this is a student from earlier batch but he gave me 
So for example, what he did, uh, there are five action item here, but the time this one was not there. That was one of the reason of action. Timelines were not written properly. So I have to use numbering here. So for example, I say five action item here. I'll use bullet numbering here. And again, I will say five timeline here. And then in the designation column, again, I will use numbering and I will say five here. So I know I have to write like how many action item are there, how many timeline are there and how many responsible job person, right? This will make your life easier. You will not miss out uh, this small mistake that your timelines are incomplete or you have forget to write designation. This one word, one designation, one timeline will get the report rejected, right? So hierarchy of control, we are talking about welding, right? So guys, can we eliminate welding in the company, right? So I can write, we can eliminate welding need by obtaining prefabricated components, right? So instead of jointing uh, two components by welding, we can get a prefabricated components and we can join them by nuts and bolts. We don't have to do welding, number one. I'm just you know giving you example to understand how we can try to write elimination. We can also try to write uh, substitution in that regard, okay? Reducing the effect. So we can say, uh, remove fuel storage from building and build a new store away from the, for example, it, if it is a workshop. So if we cannot remove welding, we can try to remove the fuel storage from that area, right? So in this way, you can, then we can also say, we can do, for example, fire, oh, sorry, fire risk assessment is already done. We can say, we can install a fire alarm system, right? We can write about permit to work system. Uh, we can use uh, fire uh, welding blinds, not fire blanket. We can use welding blinds, uh, to cover the flammable material. So in this way, I have just written points, right? I'm because, you know, because of the time I cannot write each action item in detail. This is just for your understanding that we can do elimination, we can do fuel storage, welding blinds, permit to work system, fire alarm system. Uh, we can train employees. We can have a fire watch as a person. Uh, near the welding area, right? So guys, I would normally advise student to at least write, you know, uh, six to seven action item. Don't write less, right? You know, all of my good student whose report have been accepted just like here. So you can see this student have written like 14 action item on COVID. I'm not saying that you should write 14, but this shows detail working. So at least try to write six, seven, eight control measures in every, uh, you know, hazard in that regard. Don't write less. Don't write less. Try to show your knowledge. Try to show your understanding. You know, the sample I have shown you here, uh, you can see I have recommended student to write more. Uh, just like here. Now, this is fire student have written four action item. I have said, okay, install this, do fire risk assessment, uh, unauthorized uh, access should be blocked, warning sign, emergency risk. So at least five more action items should be written. That will make it complete. If you don't have control mayor to control the hazard, it will not be accepted, right? So we should show sufficient knowledge in that regard. One tip for everyone here. So health surveillance is a control mayor and student don't use it. Please use it as a standard when you are talking about noise, when you are talking about vibration, uh, when you are talking about radiation, 
when you are talking about chemicals, when you are talking about biological agent. For all of these hazards, this should be a standard control measure. Okay. This should be standard, right? So think for the variety, you know, think of the control measure. If you don't understand, you know, simply Google it. There are thousands of articles on Google that can help you with the control measures. Okay. Now, guys, in column number five, time scale, you know, this is important. I told you that people don't write it correctly. What is acceptable? If you see the column heading within, like within how you can do, I can write days within one day. I can write week. I can write month. I can write year as well. What you should not write? What is not acceptable? Which student don't understand despite fact telling them? What is not acceptable here? The thing that is not acceptable is if you write immediate, if you say before start of work, right? If you say uh, after one day, right? If you write in hours, many students write it in two hours. <laughs> you know, how you can measure two hours? You cannot measure two hours. You can measure like one day, two day. You know, even in our company, like, you know, when we do the risk assessment in our companies, we don't write one hour, two hour, or three hour. There is like at least a one day or two day, three day time in that one. So this is not acceptable. Then coming to the designations again, uh, you know, I have talked about it, that designation, which is not acceptable. I'll just mention those because see the title, responsible person job title. What is a job title? What is your designation, right? So don't write management. Don't write department head. Don't write simple manager. Because there is no designation as manager. Either it's like HR manager, project manager, safety manager, uh, like that one. Don't uh, write generically in that regard. And don't write generic things like all employees are something. That is not one person. You see the person. Action item can be assigned to one or two people. That, that is acceptable. But you cannot assign it to everybody. Right? One more mistake that students do is, you know, this thing. They say safety officer will do it. And what they do, they copy paste it in all action items. That safety officer will do this, safety officer. This is all wrong. You, you cannot assign all the item to one person. For example, fire alarm system, uh, procurement department need to buy it. Training might be done by safety. Uh, welding blinds is not linked with a safety officer. Fuel storage is not the concern of safety officer. Operation manager or site manager or maybe administration in charge, they will do that. Buying of prefabricated parts, that is not safety officer. Okay. So this thing is also not acceptable. Don't assign all to one person. Yes, Abdul Jabbar, please go ahead with your comment. Yes. Hello. Yes, so when dear. it comes to responsible persons, jobs and title, uh, can we assign the contractors on these regards? Like let's say, for instance, we have a contractors who are just responsible for fire alarm. Right. I mean, fire, fire, this fire, yeah, fire alarm. Installation of fire alarm. Yes, yes. Yes, so can yes, you can write. Like, uh, for instance, like, uh, for instance uh, on uh, what further controls are required, point number five. Yeah. So we can say uh, time scale, let's say one month. Yeah. And then responsible person, we can say uh, fire alarm contractor. Is that? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, yes, that is acceptable. You can write it. All right, great. Yeah. Welcome, dear. So, guys, I hope everybody is clear on this topic because, you know, part two is the most important part. This have got no word count limit. So you need to write comprehensively. You need to write in detail. And if you understand, I think that will be the best part for your report. If you complete part two correctly, that is look your uh, 60 to 70 percent report. So Yasin, for example, you say that uh, one action item you decide is 
uh, daily monitoring and supervision of welding activities. For example, you say this is my daily job and you don't understand, okay, what is the time scale? So uh, first time when you will implement this action item, what will be the timeline? You're gonna start supervision from day one, day two, day three. If you think that, okay, it's gonna take me three days to start this activity, that should be three days. Don't think that you are doing what subsequently will make it a daily. So if somebody would write daily, not acceptable, or somebody would write weekly, not acceptable, because you cannot measure it. If you write daily, how would I know that it is today or tomorrow or day after? Which are we talking about? So implementation of things is important. Guys, I'm going to give you one more tip. Okay. Many times students are confused about, you know, these timelines. They don't understand. Okay. Should I write one week or two week or, you know, days and things like that. One. Make a table. Make a table that how the activity is written. For example, I say, if you have to do risk assessment of something, if you have to do training, if you have to provide PPE, if you have to buy an equipment, uh, just one minute, let me finish and then I'll come to your question. Uh, buy an equipment, uh, make a process, right? These are generic things that you can write in your risk assessment, okay? Just make a table of that one. For example, I say risk assessment in my company, it takes one week. Training in my company, I can do it in three days, right? Providing PP, I have to buy it. Maybe it's going to take one week in that regard. Buying an equipment, for example, it can be a forklift truck, a welding machine, so many things. So I'll say it's going to take at least one month in that regard. Making a new process, it's going to take two weeks. So just make a generic table like that one. And whenever you are writing something, like for example, training of employees, this is my action item. So I will come here and I'll say, okay, training, I'll just write three days. Just make a guideline table for yourself and then write all the action item timelines accordingly. You don't have to think on each and every action item. Okay, what it will be like that one. Just like permit to work is a process. So I say making a process two weeks, I'll write two weeks here. Done, right? That will make your life easier in that regard. All right, so... Uh, there is uh, column one and two use bullets uh, while numbering for instance numbering is the listing is it a mix or it's okay uh Bernard, that is okay you can use numbering or something uh, i normally distinguish the columns that is why i use numbering in uh, column four and in column three i use bullets so that we don't confuse the two columns just to make it segregate uh, basically, this is your recommendation. Column number four, five, six, that is your recommendation. Uh, three is what they are already doing. That is why I'm using bullet points. But you can use numbering in column three as well. There is no hard rule. This is just my guidelines of making sure that we prepare a report in a good way. Okay. So guys, uh, we have 30 minutes. So I hope everybody is clear on part two because that is the most important one. That is where we have to show our understanding and knowledge in that regard. All right. So we have part three. Part three. Yes, uh, Jabbar, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I still have one more question regarding the person who is responsible. Huh? Yeah. In part one, we mentioned the part one. The summer that we mentioned people's uh, like managers, people who are just uh, yeah. in control of them. So when uh, we are measuring this responsible person, jobs and title, are we supposed also to, these people, are they supposed to be in part one or can just make any? No, that is not necessary. It is not necessary that they should be in part one because you see here, for example, you write, for example, 70, 80 action item here. You cannot mention 70, 80 designation in part one, 200 word count will be completed. So it is okay. Uh, there should not be any problem if you have not mentioned uh, some designation in part one in that way. But please be careful about one thing, okay? So for example, you see, I have used word here, operation manager, right? Now in part two, if I have to use operation manager, I will use the same designation, operations manager, 
I should not write some different designation like operations and logistics manager. That will be wrong, right? Because it, this is not something I have written in part one. Part one is operation manager. So I should use the same. So just be careful in this thing that whatever is in part one, same designation is used. Otherwise, if something is not mentioned in part one, that is perfectly fine. No worries in that regard. All right. Right. -o. So guys, moving on to part number three. And the first table in that one is very easy. So that is moral, journal, legal, and financial documents, right? So I would request you to open the book while writing that one. Uh, you know, our book has really good information on that thing. So you don't have to go here and there. Just go to your book and open 1.1 Morals and Money, right? So I'll just tell you the page number so that you can use it to write uh, the moral reason. Okay, so they are asking you to write three things, moral, financial, and legal. So you're going to open this one, element one, right? And 1.1, morals and money. And I'm going to go to the second page, right? Now, just see these paragraphs, these three paragraphs that are there. This is what, this is your moral arguments. Okay. They have already written the text. You just have to rewrite into your own wording. Number one, ILO statistics are there which show a lot of pain and suffering. Right? Uh, number two. All right. Number two is people can get killed and injured in a gruesome way. Point number two. What about their dependents, families, friends, and colleagues? Point number three, this is morally accept, unacceptable. Point number four, right? Employer have a moral responsibility to provide a safe workplace. Point number five, this is the right thing to do. Point number six, uh, society expected. Point number seven, these are the basic minimum things you should write in your report. These seven things. And this will complete your moral argument right you don't have to search anywhere just rewrite this information in your own wording for the company that you are talking about right this is your moral argument now if i go to the financial which is next one so already they have given five examples of direct cost and indirect cost you can simply write this is five example of your direct cost and next page has five example of your indirect cost in that regard. That complete your second part, financial documents. Right? Done. Just rewrite it in your own wording. Don't copy paste it. If you copy paste it, that is malpractice. You have to write everything on in your own wording and language. Okay. One more thing is remaining that is journal legal. And for that, I will go to 1.2, regulating health and safety. Okay. Here they have this clause, employer responsibility. Right. So you have to mention under legal that Article 16 of ILO C-155 has defined employer responsibility. Now, what is the employer responsibility? They have to provide a safe workplace. They have to provide safe machinery and equipment. They have to provide safe work processes. They have to provide PPE. They have to protect employees from chemical, physical, and biological hazard. These are the five points you just going to explain in your own words. So from your book, from your RRC book, you can simply write the arguments, and that should not be challenged. A uh, student should not fail in this one because this is just basic stuff from your book. There is no logical reason for anyone to write incorrect here. You will uh, have challenge if you don't mention ILO C-155 or you don't mention the proper moral argument, the seven points that are there. If you don't mention at least 10 examples, which I have told you for the... If you write this one, this fulfills the criteria. And your this table... Moral, general, legal, and financial is done. Right? Now, the next part, we have to select three action items from part two. 
and we're going to write them in detail. So they have said taken from column four of risk assessment. Most of the time students make the mistake, they pick a different action item, which is not in part two. And the examiner say from where this come, you have not mentioned. So for example, this is a sample report. Uh, yeah. Can you see my comment? He is saying for electricity that we will do this, this, this. And I'm saying this action item is not in part two. <laughs> you know why you are using it here? This is logical that you cannot make a new action item. First mention it in part two and then select it from there and then write about it. You cannot introduce a new thing here. And that was a repeat problem here as well. Again, this action item was not there. I don't know why he tried to put it here. So these are the things that you know, cause problems. So I'll go up to the hazard. For example, so guys, out of these eight action items, a question to everyone, which action item should I pick? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Which action item from column four should I pick? What is your opinion? the uh, ptw okay so why garba you wanna pick up an administrative control because i told you administrative control will not eliminate the hazard vincent is saying one or two so i will follow his advice because that is correct you have to pick an important action item that can control the hazard like out of these if i say daily monitoring Daily monitoring will not stop the fire from happening. Maybe the fire can happen when you are not doing the supervision then. So you have to pick an, an action item which is important. So you can either pick one or two. So let me say I will pick up action item number one. So most important thing, copy the same action here. So I will copy paste the same action here. I will not write something different. Don't make this mistake of writing something different. And just mention this is hazard category fire. And just to correlate the information, what I will do, I will go to part two and I will write here, this is my action item number one of part three. So this make it easier for me and the examiner to identify that this is the point I have used in part three. So I will also know that I have selected an action item from here. An examiner will also know that he has selected from here. He has not written a different one, okay? So this is my first one. So guys, then legal requirement. So I have written for five. So what I will do, I'll go to Google, okay? And I'll write here, ILO for fire safety whatever hazard you are talking about just write it here for example i will say ilo for manual handling so it will tell me which is the relevant code like c127 is there right and i will go to that one and i will try to identify what is the legal requirement in manual handling uh, please understand that all the requirement related to ilo will be acceptable don't refer to HSC UK, don't refer to QCS, don't refer to any national law, because here we are talking about international law, not local law. Uh, yes, Farah, please go ahead with your question. I think you, Mr. Azhar, you just did answer my question. All right, that's good. Uh, just one moment, let me try to find what is... Uh, Yeah, so just see Article 3 here. No worker shall be required or permitted to engage in manual transport of a load by which it is likely to jeopardize his health and safety. So for manual handling, I will simply say that ILO for manual handling C-127 has this requirement that no employee should be injured or his health should not be affected because of manual handling. And then I can explain it further that, okay, this is a legal requirement. It is a, it has to be. Now I was referring to fire safety. So again, I can 
you know, simply search the relevant one. And this is ILO for fire safety. And I'll try to say what should employers do? Employees should carry out a risk assessment based on the employer need to ensure adequate appropriate. Okay, so this is the law, what they have written. So I will copy it and I will try to write, rewrite in my own wording here. So you can say here that ILO for fire safety requires the employers to do this, this, that, right? Now, please understand while you are writing the legal arguments, please don't copy paste everything from ILO. Explain in your own wording. You have to write yourself. Don't just copy paste from ILO and think I have done my job. No, you have to write in your own wording. What is the responsibility of QCC in that regard? And also another thing that you have to mention the results of non-compliance. If my company QCC, if they don't follow the law for fire safety, what will happen? What will be the consequence? There will be fire, so there will be property damage. There will be fine from the government bodies. There will be compensation claim. That all you need to mention here, right? <clears throat> Now guys, the, the next part is the most important one and the failure in part three is because of this thing. So I'll just do one thing, you know, we have to follow that table that we have learned in element number 3.4 risk assessment, okay? And normally you should have it like that one. I'll simply copy it in the blank template. Right, so guys, you have to create categories for likelihood and severity. These are the same categories that are given in your RRC book and that is the same what we have studied in our uh, syllabus as well. Now, five categories for likelihood, five categories for severity. Most of the time, a student copy pasting from old reports, what they do, they have categorization for severity, but not for likelihood, right? And that is incomplete. They have to make for both. You can have four categories as well. I don't have any objection to that one, but not less than four because you know the type of company I have selected, construction companies are very big. So we should not write less categories. Then what you have to do is you have to select a likelihood level and severity level. For example, I say that the likelihood level for fire from welding is let's say four, likely, and then I have to justify why I have written four. And same is the case with severity, right? So I say severity level, people can die from five. And I will have to justify why it is five, right? This is half part. Half of the part is this one that you have to write here and you have to write in detail. You have to mention the type of injuries and ill health. Guys, who's going to tell me from where this thing is going to come? From where I can write this one? WHO, CDC. Two. No, no, part two. two. Yes, I have already written two. same things here. So what you will do is simply copy the consequences from here Control C and Control V in your part three. Don't write different things, okay? So the type of injuries that can happen, copy paste everything that you have already written above, right? That will fulfill. Then they have said number of workers. So I can say how many workers can be exposed to fire? Maybe 100, 120, that is your estimation. Then you say how often this activity is carried out. I'm talking about welding. How often welding is carried out? Let's say it is carried out daily. And how widespread the hazard is? Uh, fire will spread everywhere. So I will say, uh, yes, it is a widespread hazard. Now, if I'm talking about manual handling, I will say no, because manual handling is not done by everybody. It will not affect everybody in the company. COVID, fire, maybe dust. These are those things that will affect everybody in the company. So please be sensible in that regard that type of injuries, a number of workers, all these things should be written properly in that regard. All right, that's good. 
So guys, in this way, we're going to finish this likelihood and severity part. The last part is these three. What is the intended impact of the action item? Number one, justification for the time scale. So if I make points here, what is the intended impact? This will eliminate the hazard, you know? That is why I ask you that what action item should I pick? If you say PTW, then you can write that it will eliminate. No, you cannot write that one. So you have to give justification that, uh, you know, if we eliminate the welding, fire will not happen because the activity is not being done. The second thing is time scale. From where time scale is coming? Again, go up part two. So I will go to part two. What I have written here. So I have written, for example, one day. I'm, this is just, let me just write one month because you know one day will be logically incorrect. So let's say prefabricated components, whatever you have written here, one month, copy it here and give justification. So I will say one month because you know we will have to identify the vendor we will have to obtain quotation uh, we will have to buy parts and then eliminate welding so in this way you can justify that why one month is required and the last thing is also important do you think this action will fully control the risk so i will say yes it will fully control the risk now imagine that you have selected administrative control and you write here no it will not control the risk do you think that will be a good statement if i write it here in my report what is your opinion uh no please sir because you have to find a way to reduce or to eliminate the risk yeah, yeah that is perfect so that means you have to select your action item sensibly. You have to pick up an action item which you can write here. So you can write two statements. Yes, it will fully control the risk or it will partially control the risk. Don't pick up an action item where you are going to write, no, it will not control. That is not acceptable. The examiner will say your choice is incorrect. So you have to prioritize three action items which you think are important one. And that will have a good impact on health and safety of the company, right? So this thing is important. So guys, in this way, one action item is done, okay? Now, important thing, most important thing. I have selected one action item from five. Now you cannot use five. The next action item should come from a different hazard. I cannot use fire again. So my action item number two, it can be from manual handling and any other hazard. And in a similar way, I will complete it and three will be from a different hazard. Then I cannot use both manual handling and fire. So you will have to complete this one. So guys, this will complete our part three in that regard, right? The last part is fairly simple. It is just the logical uh, administrative process. So even you can write part four, even before you write part two as well. That is uh, not uh, much linked with anything. So first thing they are asking for the review period. Okay. So what is the date I have mentioned in my part two? I have mentioned 19th of May, 2023. Okay. So you can write the same thing in part four. So you're going to write here my risk assessment date is this one and you can say uh, QCC has a policy of annual review or by annual review that is your choice so guys what will be the risk assessment due date it is 19th of May 2023 after one year you have to write the due date okay sir yeah so that will be 19th of May, 2024. Now this is simple math, but many students get it wrong. Sometimes they mention it by annual here. Then you have to write the date accordingly. So it is like uh, June, July, August, September, October, November. 
So then this date should be November 2023, right? So whatever the policy statement you write here, you have to write according to that one. Yes, thank you, Binard. That you can also write 18th or 19th, both are acceptable. Uh, second, guys, is that why risk assessment will be reviewed? Why we need to review the risk assessment whenever there is a change in law, technology, people, products, equipments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can write some reasons that okay, if there is a change in ILO C one sixty seven, RC one twenty seven, we need to review the risk assessment. Okay, so this is sort of like a administrative thing. Uh, second. Uh, row is that how you're going to communicate the risk assessment to the people. So there, uh, yes, Garba, please go ahead. Uh, so I was saying that um, looking at the risk assessment date and the policy biannual because it's not correct. Well, you, you have to remove it because you told us it's not correct. So if you don't remove it, people might think that maybe it's it's the exact thing we should put there. I will just suggest. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Let me write annual. Okay. All right, so there are two types of people in your organization. So there can be management, top management, middle management, and workers. So how are you going to communicate the risk assessment control measures to them? So with the management, I can say maybe I will email them. Then I will have a management meeting with them, right? With the workers, you can say maybe toolbox talk. Maybe you can put it up on notice board, the new control measures. Uh, maybe you can have a training session. Maybe you can have a safety meeting with them. So that is your choice, like how you can show your understanding that these things can be communicated to the management and the workers in that regard. Uh, Kennedy, you can also write six months uh, because you know different company have a different policy in that regard. So nobody will say six months is wrong or uh, annual is wrong, but majority of the company do have annual review. Normally, nobody has a time to review everything on biannual basis. Logically, that will not be much, uh, you know, sound in that regard. Annual will be much better idea. <clears throat> so I was talking about second uh, row that was communication. So we can say communication with the management, communication with the workers different methods you can i have written points here i'm not saying you should write it like that one you should write in detail in proper paragraphs but i'm just giving you guideline that this sort of information should be included there right and lastly how you're going to follow up the risk assessment so that means action item have been communicated to management and workers so how are you going to do the follow-up so you can say uh, you will uh, set up, for example, weekly meetings or visits to the site, right? You can ask for pictures of implementation, right? Normally, what we do, just like, you know, I was working remotely uh, and I was managing 12 offices, so I was asking them to send me videos, pictures, uh, you know, having a meeting with them, having email updates from them. So this is how normally follow-up is done. And the last thing which we need to mention is escalation. So for example, if some action item is delayed, what you're going to do? So I will say, okay, I will escalate to the journal manager for, uh, you know, push uh, to the managers to complete things on time. Just like, you know, you have to report it sometime to the top management that things are not being done on time. Or these are being delayed in that regard. So these kind of things are there. That is why I was telling you that this part four is fairly easy. You can even write it before completing. And I have not seen anyone fail in part four except for one reason. The only reason is if your due date is not correct. Sometimes students don't write it correctly. That is simple math. Whatever you have written in part two plus one year, that is your due date. And that is simply write it. If you write it correctly, I agree part four should not have any challenge for anyone in that regard. All right, so everyone, we are done with the review. Yes, Jabbar, please go ahead.
Yeah, uh, actually, for instance, you go to a refer and uh, you need to receive it again. So is it uh, uh, supposed to do the same exam, I mean, the same assessment, risk assessment you did and uh, make correction and submit it? Or uh, you can just come up with a new idea, new risk no, no. no, no, you just have to correct the same one and resubmit. Don't, you don't need to create a new one. You can create a new to, new one, but then examiner will check each and everything. Okay. Now, please understand that, for example, Nibosh, if someone, God forbid, fails, Nibosh will give them a feedback like that one. And they will say that your this portion, this portion is not correct, are not met. You just need to correct these portion. You don't need to redo the whole report. Right. So just that portion, correct it and resubmit, it will be approved. But the problem is that one that you will have to pay additional fees. That is 800 reals in that regard. So that should not happen. You know, so ideally first time we should complete the report in a proper way and resubmit it. Right. All right. Thank you, Morris, uh, for your inputs. That was the objective that everyone should learn. And we should learn from the student in past the mistakes that they made. We should not make them same. Uh, when said, do I have to explain much at part four or just points? You can just write in points. You don't have to write very lengthy in that one. If you see the word count here, this is just 100 to 150 words. So if you just write like four or five lines, that is enough. It is just like one page. Okay, so guys, one thing I'll just share with you. Uh, yes, Garba, please go ahead. I said um, a question depending on regarding the the refer. So if someone is refer, he does not supposed to go and pay another money for another re-examination. He should just correct himself and yeah. just reset no, it no, again. Will, yeah, that is what I said. He will have to pay 800 reals for IG2 for reset for the registration. That is why, you know, we are putting so much effort that students should not fail uh, after the first attempt. They should pass in the first attempt, right? Uh, yes, uh, Manie, please go ahead with your question. Yes, sir. My question is, uh, I had the challenges. I did not capture our whole uh, lecture. Please, if I can get the the what the whole lecture kindly, if you can. Yes, you will get. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah that you. will Another be on thing. YouTube. That will be on YouTube. Please don't worry. Uh, we will share with all the participants in that regard. Okay, there is another point you've just explained. Eh? that uh, if someone has not made some sections uh, in this report, eh, then there is other places that this guy met. So if uh, he has to redo the exam, so only uh, attempt the, the place, the section that this uh, student did not met. Yes, yes, only whatever is not met, we will correct it. So guys, I'll just uh, share with you, yesterday the result was out for this batch. And in that batch, I'll just show you one report of the student. Uh, she was uh, one student from Turkey. And, you know, she cleared both IG1 and IG2 in the first attempt. And I was happy. I think she got 53 marks in IG1 or 55 and IG2. So I'm just showing you her work for IG2. Okay, this is a construction company. Uh, you can see uh, the introduction given for the construction company. Activities are defined, equipment are defined, employees are written, uh, different designation are written, working hours are written, Friday off day is written. Then she said that I'm gonna do a uh, risk assessment for Doha North Road construction project. Then she has given other, so this part is complete. Then she has written all the things that she referred to IO, uh, she followed HSE UK five-step methodology, she prepared a checklist. She went to the site. She met different people. She did interview. She did observation. She did document review uh, and all those things. And then she referred to ILO for good. So this part one is done, right? Then this is part two. Now, please see how detailed she has written action item. Just like action number one, that is thoroughly detailed written action item, right? Even more than my expectation. Uh, normally I would advise students just to write maybe one line or maybe two lines, but she has written properly in detail. Uh, you can see here, even the consequences here, right? So everything is in proper detail. Numbering is there. 
So she would know that, okay, I have written seven action item, seven time scales, seven uh, responsible person in that regard. So many times, you know, students have a misconception that nobody clears in the first attempt. That is not the case. You know, in my every batch, you know, I'm very happy with the March batch that uh, I think except for one or two, everybody cleared the report. Um, mostly students were not able to, uh, how she was able to do it, she just followed the guideline. Just like I gave you everything today, whatever the lesson learned I have, uh, whatever the problem I have seen, uh, and I can guarantee you whatever DSS is sharing this information with you, no learning provider will do that, right? And uh, this kind of webinar, you know, normally on YouTube, there will be a lot of webinars, but they will not talk very specifically that exactly what information is to be written. They will give you generic guideline uh, in that, right? not as specific as what we are doing right now. So this is it for part two, though there were still some comments that she might have corrected and submitted uh, in that regard. I'll just show you part three. So just like the legal requirements initially she wrote, there were legal, you know, things were not there. Obviously she would have corrected it. I don't have the final copy to that one, but you know, at least she had written uh, properly likelihood, severity and everything in that regard. So. So overall, it was a good report. I'll just show you the last part. Uh, so here, it's a very simple one. That is, uh, I think, Garba, I think you have asked that you need to write in detail. You just need to write like that one, four, five, six lines. That will be enough. Uh, just these things that you want you define, change and review, that need to be written in a little bit more detail in that regard. Right? So... Um, every month, you know, a lot of student, uh, not only DISS, but even sometimes from outside, they also seek our advice and guidance in that regard. And we are always happy to guide them, you know, uh, because two things we pursue. One is that short term objective is to gain the qualification, but the long term objective for every student should be to uh, have the learning, you know, the thing risk assessment is no doubt the most important thing every health and safety professional should understand. You know, I always tell risk assessment and incident investigation. So I hope after today's session, everybody should have clarity, should have good idea about, you know, what should go into your risk assessment report in that regard. So I'm done from my side. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know in that regard. Uh uh, hi, sir. Please, if I may, concerning the weight count at the last end, I think maybe that one can help a bit. The weight count. So, uh, after, dear, yeah, please go ahead. After the whole, uh, let me see, after the whole risk assessment is done, uh, I think within you have to put on uh, the weight count so that you can deduct the ones you've written from the ones that was already in the chat. So if okay. you can get yeah. No, uh, dear, I think you are confused. That you have to do on IG1, not on IG2. On okay. IG2, hey, thank yeah, you, sir. <laughs> yeah, for IG2, we don't have to write any word count there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Right. Now, Kennedy is asking under legal, should we specify for the Qatar? No, Kennedy. Uh, all the requirement that you need to mention in part one, and part three, that should be ILO. You can mention, if you don't find any specific ILO, you can simply mention ILO C-155, right? That is important for you. Don't mention UK, don't mention Qatar, simply mention ILO UK guidelines in that regard, okay? All right, so uh, can you send me our, uh, you, our risk assessment report to check and clarify? Uh, okay, Wahab, you may share. Uh, I can give you general guideline on that one, but obviously every student have to correct and, uh, you know, uh, make their own report final one. Uh, thank you, Jabbar, for your comment. Uh, if you have learned from it, then definitely, you know, we have achieved our, you know, goal for this session as well. All right, Ms. May, I think we can wrap up the session if you would have some other information to share with everyone. I am good. I think we've covered everything. So, well, again, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. 
So if you have any questions or additional questions that you would like to ask Mr. Azar, you can send them to info at diss.com.qa. And regarding the recording, you will be receiving, as I've mentioned in the chat room, um, a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours hey, with a link okay. to view the recording of today's webinar. Also, you can check our and follow our YouTube channel and all our social media platforms so you'll get updated on um, other free webinars that we have. Okay? So on behalf of the ISS and Mr. Azar, Again, thank you for joining us today and have a great and enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank have a you. Good day. Bye for much. Bye. Bye.